so we're down to the last 30 minutes here and we have a couple of questions. Uh, again, this is this is the first session is on authentication process governing published Quran translations. Uh, so, so my question, I'm going to start with a question. We're going to have a couple of others going to come in as well. Uh, the Qur'ans, as we're hearing right now, the Qur'an's authenticity, we know it lies in the original Arabic form. And we know that was divinely revealed uh, into that particular language. Now, the question is, however, considering the significance of translations and facilitating understanding for non-Arabic speakers, which is what we've been addressing, should there be an authentication process to ensure accurate interpretations were, were, were preserving while preserving the integrity of the text. And I want to ask that to each of the presenters. Uh, so I, I'd like to, if we could just go through each one uh, 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 again. So considering the significance of translations and facilitating understanding for non-Arabic speakers, should there be an authentication process to ensure accurate interpretations while preserving the integrity of the text? Uh, so I, we can start with, uh, is Dr. Safi available? If not, we'll go to Dr. Saleem for that question. We move to Dr. Saleem, that would be good. Okay, Dr. Saleem. <clears throat> you're, on, you're on mute, Dr. Saleem. And in view of the time, Brother Imam, if we can keep the comments sh short and precise. Well, I think that the authentication process uh, for the for, this, for the huge nature of translations that we already have is, is a practical impossibility. And also it would impose, uh, I mean, op opinions from, on, from one person to another. I think a more uh, accurate or a more acceptable thing is that people should be allowed to translate and they should be allowed to discuss and mutually correct or uh, accept each other's translations. Uh, because of the fact that uh, the, had this been something of a process of authentication, uh, that was required. The Prophet uh, himself must should have done it. I mean, he never did it. He just gave us the text of the Quran and he allowed us to ponder on it and come to our own conclusions. So as far as we are sincere in understanding the Quran and competent in Arabic, uh, differences of opinion should be should be accepted. Uh, simply, as I said, the Prophet himself did so. Had uh, the authentication process been required, he would have been the first person to not only give the Quran, but also maybe a translation as well. So the text is the real thing, and that should yeah. suffice. As far as the translations are concerned, people should be allowed to translate, and it should be critically, they should be critically evaluated. Translations will will, will continue to exist if this uh, stand the test of time, and uh, that is my take on it. Thank, thank, thank you, Dr. Saleem. Is uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Kid Y still with us? I don't see him. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll move to uh, Dr. Peachy. Same question, Dr. Peachy. You're on mute, Dr. Peachy. Okay, I'm muted. Uh, I agree with uh, Sheikh Salim. Uh, I think it's practical impossibility, and I think it's possibly dangerous too. Um, he, he, because politics, unfortunately, are involved in religion, and maybe this the more so in some countries where the the population is Muslim. Um, people use religion to further their own goals. Um, let me read a a, a, a paragraph that I. Uh, in it from a paper of mine um, uh, on my translation. I say my translation. My I had a collaborator, Mani Al Johani, uh, Saudi Arabian national, and um, we had to consider uh, this a sec a res particularly restricted secondary audience. This audience included Islamic scholars, publishers, and state organs in the country of publication, that is the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. The two knew that any work on the Quran, particularly the commentary, commentaries and translations were sensitive materials for the royal Saudi government. It was an important factor motivating the collaboration of, of us both. Uh, 
El Johani was part of that state as a professor at King Saud University and then as an appointed member of the Consultative Council. Until his death, he was also Secretary General of WAMI, a non governmental charitable Islamic organization. Both Peachy and Johani had hoped that the Johani's knowledge and experience, as well as his relations and connections with the Saudi state, would help avoid bureaucratic mistakes. Unfortunately, his death had a negative impact in this area as well. The Royal Saudi Ministry of Information still has not issued the required permission for distribution of the text within the kingdom of itself. Thus, while the pace of publication was the kingdom, the distribution had to begin abroad. Hmm. So that's just sort of a, a little bit of a lesson to the to uh to many of us translators you know we have you have to be careful where you submit it uh uh you might get a reaction that you're not anticipating mate and maybe a negative one so that's my answer <laughs> oh no appreciate you sharing that um uh dr Fiji. um we're gonna go to um uh Shuaib abdullahi uh so you have that question and i do want to say that uh, professor al khatib i do see your hand we're gonna, we're gonna, we got a couple of written ones we're gonna we're gonna respond to before coming to you. So just want to let you know that so we, we have noticed you. Go ahead, uh, Chuey. Yeah, uh, for me, uh, just as uh, uh, the the uh, David PC says, and also uh, brother Shahaz Salim. Uh, I think if we have to put it in that, if it have to be an authenticating process, that that will be left for a panel where they have to pass on their their point of views, and uh, sometimes it can be this, there can be some bias. And the, the reason why I'm saying this is because some most of the cases, as uh, Brother Davud says, these are the, it, the religious affiliations have been having political influences. And this can have some implications when it comes to making some authentications and who to favor and who not to favor. <clears throat> uh, I think it will be left for the, 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 the audience also who are patronizing such uh, translators or translations we have out there to, to pass on their judgment based on what they find in such books. Because if they can call attention with whatever whatsoever authority will be in the process of authenticating such books then they can call the attention as to maybe call this person for for you know to to for assessment or something yeah then, then in that case maybe yes it might make sense but to to have an uh, organized uh, organization in charge of that to pass on legislation and so on as to who should translate who should not to translate that would be a question mark to handle so this is what i can i can say for now thank you i'm the lot no certainly appreciate that uh, uh, Sister Fitra has some of the written questions that, that she's going to present now, and so we'll turn to her. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, so, in view of the um, responses that uh, to Imam Talib's question uh, to respect the scholarship of other translations and interpret uh, translators' interpretation of Allah's uh, sacred revelations, I have this question to you. We know that there are words used in translations that are misunderstood to justify hurting others, like beat your wife lightly. We are in 2023, and we want our generations behind us to follow and refer to the Quran for their life. I want to know what process, what responsibility do translators have to correcting these kinds of concepts that are misunderstood while yeah. respecting the scholarship of other translators? Man, that sounds like that's for each of the presenters who want to address it. Uh, so I can let you who want to go first on that, those who are here who are left with us. I can give an opinion, uh, if I may. Uh, Sister uh, Fatra, unfortunately, you and I think uh, these are misinterpretations, yet have seen people who will argue, will show you why this is the literal word of Allah. So this is a big subject. Uh, definitely, we should delve into it. Definitely, we should resolve it. 
but there are, of course, unfortunately, uh, differences in, in, in opinions. Thank you, thank you. Any other, other presenters, any other presenters wanna chime in on that, Dr. Peachy? Yeah, um, I had a footnote on that. <laughs> Uh, there is a, there is a hadith for, for that, of course. Um, and I think it was, you know, something like you, you, if you beat them, you have to use something like a wet noodle. In other words, you can't harm the person. Yes. It has to be symbolic. That's my understanding of that particular thing. And of course we do have to translate what's there. That's our duty too. But on the other hand, uh, if it's going to cause uh, misunderstanding, we should try to preempt the misunderstanding by explaining it and make sure that it, the misunderstanding uh, is not incorrect. Yeah, now that's important. Uh, and and just, just want to just share this real quick, briefly. <clears throat> I, I'm, I, I have a, a lot of groups I'm with that some national women here in, in America. I received a phone call from one of the presidents of a national women's organization. Uh, they saw an article, and I know we have some, some scholars here from Pakistan. And I guess um, what she, this is what she said to me. She said, hey, ma'am, have you seen what happened in Pakistan? She said, the president uh, said that the men can't beat their wives. Said they can't beat their wives. <laughs> and I guess, and so you all do, you from Pakistan, so you know, this is what she's around to me. And so she said, ma'am, I feel for those women. And it's because because what happened was the, the scholars in the country, the imams, went to the president at the time and said he can't say what they have permission from the Quran to do. And that's why she said to me, ma'am, I feel for those women. And so that kind of addresses uh, what you're saying, uh, Dr. Peachy. But I won't let Do uh, uh, Dr. Salim had, had the comment, had his hand up as well. Yes, I think this is a very, very uh, sensitive topic. And I think the linguistics, uh, or the language of the Quran must be invoked in a very deep way. And uh, as far as this verse is concerned, I also think, like Dr. P.G., that it has a certain symbolic significance. The the, the way that the, the Quran mentions is, is the word Fadribuhunna, that you can strike them. The word striking here, if you look at the context of the verse, actually is an option, it's not an obligation. And it can only be used if the wife stands up in, against the authority of the husband or challenges his authority. And at the same time, the way it has been mentioned is, is like uh, uh, something to stop divorce from happening. So if using uh, beating or striking your wife could, uh, I mean, initiate divorce itself, which for which it has been actually made as a, as a, as a barrier, then obviously this, this, uh, this option cannot be used. So I, what I'm saying is that, yes, the Quran does allow it. It has a very specific context, very specific circumstances. For example, when the wife has become unfaithful or uh, sort of that, but uh, in most situations of today, uh, although the option is there, it might not be wise to exercise this option all the time. It's, it's an option, but that was available in tribal cultures. Uh, we still have tribal cultures, and these cultures, at times, such a corrective measure can stop the divorce from taking place and uh, keeping the family intact. So I view it as a measure to, to keep the family intact. But if this is not going to happen, then this, uh, this, uh, this uh, option should not be used at all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Abdullahi, again, uh, Sister Fitcher, it was broad, but she did. She gave that example. But do you want to you want to you want to address that? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I myself have come across certain translation of words in the Quran, which people have done. And uh, I seem to be is, is for me, it's mind boggling. Right. And that goes back to the issue of the authentication process as to which authority do the translators have to decide certain <clears throat> things of words because it influences the way people read and pass on legislation as well. And I've had notions where people will ask me about the beating verse in Quran chapter 4 verse 34. I didn't interpret it or translate it as to mean directly, literally beat, strike somebody. And also the notion of they are cutting the hands of the thief or, you know, so on. It depends on how people will implement that. And it has to do with the judiciary system of the said country as well. 
and we, how 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 learned they are to implement such uh, notions of judgment from such books and this influence and we can take like, for instance saudi arabia as in also pakistan for example but it all depends on if this will not be done in a biased form if it will be done with sincerity then yes they can come across with uh, with, with, with the actually closer to the truth translation where people or interpretation where people can be accustomed to and it, it fit in the lifestyle but to just be influenced with a particular translation whereby we don't know uh what what uh preconceived uh notion that this translator has whether he's being influenced by the particular denomination or sectarian type of view whether he's being influenced by an external source before translating such a view that that should all be taken into what account so i agree with the question the sister is asking we, we by 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 meaning we shouldn't just see that one standard of translating or translation decides what the majority or others think about a particular view from the Quran. First of all, now this is my input for this. Thank you. Thank you. So let me just go ahead and note just one thing that was put in the chat from one of the other, one of the other uh, participants. It said, in the son of the Prophet Muhammad, the prayer peace upon him, never struck his wives. In the Quran, there's a reference to Prophet Ayyub, alayhi salam, who swore to strike his wife, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave dispensation to strike with 100 blades of grass. Uh, so subhanAllah, a lot of material in Sharia to explain this. So again, this is kind of complementing what, what many of you just said uh, as well. I just wanted to share that also for those who are not on the platform to see that chat who are on the YouTube. Uh, back to Sister Fitra. Uh, we want to recognize a uh, Professor uh, El Kati, please, if I'm mispronouncing your name. Uh, Professor Abdullah. Yes. Uh, Salaamu Alaikum, everybody. Thank you very much for this uh, uh, important uh, conference. Uh, my question is to uh, Professor Dawood Pichi. Uh, if we are going to translate the Holy Quran into uh, English, what's your advice? Should we have, a, a, for example, a tafsir, a shorter, a short tafsir, then we translate this tafsir we, as a guidance, or we should go directly to, to a translation? Uh, and what, in your opinion, from seeing, uh, I have written a book about translation of the Holy Quran I, um, uh, in, 19, in 2014, uh, and uh, I have realized a lot of shortcomings in, in having a universal English translation. So I would like to, you and uh, Dr. Uh, Abdullah and uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Sharif to comment on this. Uh, the last question is how you uh, co uh, recommend translating the word Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Should we go to God and, you know, this uh, issue. The last yeah. thing I would like to comment on, uh, uh, Islam never allows a man to hit his woman. This is the, as, and as I, I have heard from my, um, from uh, one of the commentator, commentators, uh, that the Prophet sallam, never hit a woman. This is very true. But the Quran here is speaking about a disobeying woman who is going with another man or is disobeying her, her husband. So the Quran has given three options. You have to, to uh, advise her. Then, uh, abstain from, uh, from uh, sleeping with them. Thirdly, if she consists on this, as Dr. Peachy said, uh, hitting is not allowed. Hitting uh, uh, by for, for, uh, with force to 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 put your force on your woman. It's just you are you are you are uh, 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 trying to prevent this woman from from uh, from uh, uh, destroying the family because Islam never allows. I never hit my wife. Uh, all people who are uh, uh, who know Islam never allow this. But we don't have the, the permission to change the word If you are a translator, you have to stick to the translation. Right. You are not allowed to, to, to deviate from that. Thank you very much. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. Thank, thank you, uh, Professor El, El Khati. So, so uh, Dr. Pichi, we'll start with you, but then, then, because you, you also want the others to come in, uh, Dr. Salim and also Abdullahi. So go ahead, Dr. Pichi. Well, to answer the, the second question you had first, um, uh, in my translation, 
we translated Allah as God with a capital G. And there was a specific reason for that because our primary audience was non-Muslims. It was a Dawat translation. So uh, people, we, my, in my experience is, you know, people would re reject that Allah is God. You know, that Allah is some foreign God, unless we use, and we drive it right home from the beginning that uh, the Quran talks about the God they know, the God of, of, the, of, the, of the New Testament, the God of, of the Torah, the God of the Psalms. So we've made that conscious decision. And, um, that, uh, and uh, of course, that was because our primary audience was non-Muslims. Okay. Uh, what was the, uh, can, what was, can you remind me of the sec, the first question, the longer question? The first question is about uh, what's your opinion and your advice. For example, if we are now going um, uh, to translate the Quran, what's your advice for uh, people who are going to translate the, Quran, the Holy Quran for a universal translation? Should we have a, uh, should we have a tafsir, then we translate the tafsir into English, or we go directly to the translation? Well, in, again, my collaborator and I, we decided to go translation and to try not to put commentary into the translation. Uh, like, you know, the earlier translations did a lot of that. And uh, the one, the official translation in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Yusuf Ali, uh, which was revised by including with my collaborator, uh, the uh, and I sort of interviewed so many Muslims, uh, non-Arab Muslims about it. And they, almost, you know, they said, it's ugly. And that's not going to convey a message if, it's, if, the, if, if the thing is ugly and awkward, cumbersome. Um, the Quran, I became a Muslim be first because the Quran is beautiful. Right. It's logical. And it, it recognizes the other religions, not like the other religions. They do not recognize us. So uh, we should, we can't, and we cannot, I don't think we can do, Tafsir is a, is a different thing. Um, uh, certainly opinions can go into it. And we have prominent Mufasirun who, disagree with one another uh, so i think the answer to that is no try i we try to restrict re, uh, restrict footnotes restrict inclination and specific and specifically to avoid putting interpolations into the translated text of the quran we try to avoid that by trying to uh, translate words and phrases which, which were specific specifically and which ones which are I have more than one meaning with more than one meaning in English and the ones that are unclear to leave them unclear so so um yeah Dr. Salim uh, yeah. now uh, Professor Al-Kati was that first question about a law specifically uh for you know Dr. Peachy because he is a convert and did the English piece, or did you, you want each one to answer the question about the law and God? Just want to make sure we give them a chance if that's what you, that's what the question is. Okay. Did you hear me, Dr. Al Khatib? Okay, go, go ahead, Dr. Salim. And, so and uh, I, I broadly agree with Dr. Peachy. You see, uh, as far as the Quran is concerned, we should just keep the translation in the text uh, yeah. uh, in, in a single volume. As far as the tafsir is concerned, we should encourage people that whenever they have a question, they, they can just look up the tafsir. After all, God did not reveal a tafsir. He, read the, he revealed the text. So if you, if you give the text to Muslims or to non-Muslims and you just ask them to read through it, and if they have a question, then they consult a tafsir. So a tafsir is like a dictionary. You don't read dictionaries, you consult dictionaries whenever it is required. So uh, my, my take would be exactly the same, that just the translation and maybe, maybe if needed, some small annotations 
uh, which do occur in even in translations in order to clarify certain things. But broadly, it should just be the translation for the reasons I just stated. The second is that I would also I have also translated the Quran uh, with the word Allah as God, because uh, as far as God is concerned, he's the God of the New Testament and the Old Testament and the God of Abraham. And mm -hmm. as as such, I mean, the word Allah exactly with the G with the capital, uh, I mean, God with the capital G is is the same as Allah. And uh, for, for precisely the same reason, I would say then when you're uh, translating the Quran in any other language, for example, in Persian or in Hebrew, the, the equivalent word of, of Allah in that language should be used uh, because it's it, it's referring to the same being. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Abdullahi, you want to answer Professor al Kutay? Kutay? <clears throat> yeah, I can I can give my input on this. Uh, now, this is this is where one of the aspects I touched on, and this is where Tarjama and Tawil comes in, which has to do with the translation and interpretation. Now, these two formulas are, are much needed when approaching the translation of the Quran. We can't just use one and leave the other. Interpretation is relevant when you are doing translation. You can just translate just because you see a word here and then you translate it just like that. That is where it spoke about the theme of the Quran. You have to understand the subject, the context, the references, and then you get the content. If we are just to put in contrast and take a word and say, because here God says ayah, so ayah means a verse, and we are going to stick with the verse, we will be mistranslating a lot of words in the Quran because one word in the Quran can have multiple meanings based on the subject, the context, and the references you are dealing with. So in other sense, like the brother, uh, sorry, I, I don't remember the name, based on the question, brother asked, how are we going to translate the word Allah into English? Now, for my years of studying the Quran and trying, being somebody who has translated the Quran, uh, people will tell you, most people will tell you, oh, we don't translate it proper now. But I give you uh, this understanding. There are different versions of a particular word in almost every language. Of course, other languages might not have the version of that particular name, but I give you an example. For instance, if you take the name uh, Mikal in the Quran, Mikal is mentioned in Quran chapter two, verse 98, right? That is Mikal, which if we have to bring the English version is Michael. We go to the Hebrew version is Mikael. We go to the uh, Portuguese or Spanish version, we have Miguel. We go to French version, we have Michel. You understand? Names can have versions. But it doesn't necessarily mean just because God says Allah. If you go to the Aramaic language, we have Allah is there. We have even Elahi is there, right? But these are versions of the same name. It doesn't necessarily have to be translated to mean God. Of course, if you come to English, they use the capital G to represent the creator of the heavens and the earth, which still makes sense concerning the translation aspect. But when we come to interpretation concerning the word, word that we mentioned, the Doraba, to mean beats and so on, we come to the notion that it is not only left to inter, uh, translation, but then that is where Tahawil comes in. And that is where God says, You go back to God and the messenger. You don't stick to your opinions or dictionary because dictionaries, remember, they are based on timelines and it is based on a particular school of thoughts on how they break down their instances or giving you, giving you meanings based on their version of an, our point of view. So we should take all these things into you know, perspective and understand if, if, if there be the case, there will be an institutional organization to actually you know, some, some kind of polish this kind of ideologies, it will make this kind of you know, steps easier for people to take a mantle in approaching how to translate the Quran and give the interpretation. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. So, Spitcher, did you have anything else? I know we're getting, uh, actually, we're at the time now. We, we're supposed to get so, ready. To... We, we'd like to recognize uh, Professor Shah before, you before uh, your remarks and my closing comments.